Today's episode of Expanded Perspectives is sponsored by Gaia.com. Help find your own truth by exploring perspectives you won't find in the mainstream on some of life's biggest mysteries. Whether it's grand conspiracies, breakaway societies, UFOs, ancient civilizations, lost wisdom, as well as the paranormal, all at your fingertips. Stream videos anywhere from your living room or on the go with the Gaia app, available through the App Store or Google Play, which gives you access to over 7,000 titles, all available to you with a monthly plan for only $9.95 a month. If you sign up now, your first month is only $0.99. Cents. There are multiple plans to choose from, including a three-month plan and an annual plan. You'll have access to incredible shows available only on Gaia, like Truth Hunter, Buzzsaw, Cosmic Disclosure, Beyond Belief, Missing Links, Hidden Origins, and Deep Space, and much, much more. Gaia is available on your Android or iPhone, Roku, Apple TV, and Amazon Fire TV. If you enjoy expanding your perspective, then you'll enjoy Gaia.com. That's G-A-I-A dot com forward slash expanded perspectives. All one word, folks. G-A-I-A dot com forward slash expanded perspectives. Let's start the show. What is going on out there, friends? That's right. You found us. It's me, Cam Hale. And uh, we're going to kick the tires and light the fires here on Expanded Perspectives. But the only way to do that is if I have a, a co-captain. I have to have a fellow reading the maps and directing where to go. And that fellow is in here with me today. I'm at the MGM Grand in Las Vegas, Nevada. And joining me right now is Kyle, the dealer, Filson. How's it going, everybody? I'm here excited that's right, folks. If you're listening to this, or when you're listening to this, Cam is currently in Las Vegas. <laughs> yeah. I'm no, not left yet. No. I'm about to leave, but not just yet. <laughs> yeah, we're recording this early so that he can go on his trip. You know, that's what I understand when people take these, when the other shows take time off, and they're like, well, we're going on vacation. I'm like, I get that, but why don't you just pre-record? Yeah. yeah. Right? Yeah, it's not literally else's I'm, fault that, that you're taking a break. Yeah. You shouldn't have to suffer. We're fixing to knock this out, folks, and then I'm fixing to jump on a plane. So that's a, a that's what's fixing to happen right now. So when you're listening to this, that's right. We will be kicking it around. Uh, I got something I want to talk to you all about, though, that I went and did. And uh, those the elite members knew I was going to go do it, and I did. And I'm going to bring it up, too. For those of you that are Alien fans, I went and watched Alien Covenant. Oh, man, I haven't seen that yet. I want to so Brad, bad. you got to go check it out. If you liked Prometheus, now, look, granted, the first time I watched Prometheus, wasn't a big fan. Went back, watched it, and I've probably watched Prometheus, no joke, probably about six times now. And kind of broke, and this one ties it all together. That's cool. This is a, this, I'm a, I'm a fan. Now, look, I know that, like we've discussed, this, you're going to hear good reviews, bad reviews, and all that. Look, if you're a fan, you're a fan. I've been reading, and that's what I've been getting, yeah. mixed reviews. But yeah. I've seen some articles that say it's awesome, some say it's terrible. I enjoyed it. I really thoroughly enjoyed it. Well, if you enjoy it, I I trust you because we've been fans of the series for a long time. I remember seeing the very first one as a little kid. Yes. Terrified. Once again, I've brought it up before. I have no idea why my parents didn't (laughs) stop me from watching terribly scary movies, but they didn't. Well, and I was sitting in there and they actually have the, uh, 
uh, the trailer released for the new remake of Stephen King. Well, I say the remake. You know, it was a television series, and then they a miniseries on television. Now they've made it into an actual movie. Yeah, of yeah. it. And it does look very disturbing, and I'm really looking forward to it. I'm usually not into that kind of stuff, but that one I'm definitely going to go see. But you talking about it as kids, my son and my nephew and my niece watched it when they were like single digits. They wanted to watch a scary movie. So I'm like, okay, I got a scary movie for you, and I popped that puppy in there, and they were not enjoying it after about 30 (laughs) minutes of it. They were like, we're out. I'm looking forward to (laughs) checking out on Showtime this Sunday. Of course, everybody hearing this is Monday, so it's already happened. So I, by the time you hear this, I would have watched it. Uh, the new series, uh, Twin Peaks, the new Twin Peaks yes, comes out. Yes, yes. And I really like the old one. Yes. So I'm hoping that they're not going to screw this new one up. I know that a lot of the actors that were in the old one were going to be in this one, so yes. it's going to be very interesting to yeah. see how that goes. Yeah. But uh, without further ado, let's get the sto- uh, the sto- let's get the show started. Let's get into the news, bud. I've, I've got you a good one. Look, and then, you know, we got lucky enough to have Lon come hop in here with us last week, and it was great. You know, we got to chat with Lon. We talked to him quite a bit off air, and it was one of those things. You know, we could have Lon on almost monthly to just do updates on crazy stories and the stuff that he received. He gets sent all the cool stories from all, <laughs> all of it. All of it. I mean, yes, he is. He's like an encyclopedia salesman. This fella has all the answers. Or at least all the stories. This one comes from Lon, and this is something he received, and I want to read this to y'all. And Of course, in homage of going to Vegas, this actually took place in Atlantic City. And the story goes like this. I need to tell someone about this, that back in September of last year, my girlfriend and I were staying at a hotel in Atlantic City. It wasn't a large hotel casino, but it was a nice place regardless. It was early one Saturday morning. We were awake, and hosting another couple from Philadelphia and sharing stories and enjoying each other's company. About 2 a.m., we realized that we were out of beer and we didn't really feel like calling it a night. My girlfriend told me that there were a couple of bottles of sparkling wine in the trunk of the car, so she tossed me the keys and I made my way out to where the car was parked. The parking wasn't very convenient at this hotel, so we had ended up parking in a spot off on a side street over a block away. I could hear the noises coming from the club down the street, but as I walked to the car, I found myself feeling unusually alone. I turned down the street to where the car was parked. The air was very heavy, misty with drizzling rain, and the street lamps reflected on a wet sidewalk. As I reached the car and unlocked the trunk, I heard a voice call out, Sir? I was very startled, and I quickly turned around to a teen boy who was gazing at me from just a few feet away. I was really unnerved, and I jumped back and said something like, Man, you just scared the hell out of me. This boy just kept looking at me unfazed. He appeared to be 16 or so, wearing old faded jeans and a dark hooded sweatshirt. Then I noticed that his eyes reflected the light from the street lamp and were completely black. I thought that he may have been on drugs, causing his eyes to dilate. But he didn't seem to be high. He appeared calm and sober. Regardless, I was totally alarmed by this encounter. He then said, I'm lost and tired. Can you give me a ride to my mom's house? But this kid didn't look tired or worried at all. It was almost like a predator leering at its prey, and I was beginning to feel fear. He started to move closer to me. I immediately broke eye contact from the boy. It wasn't easy to do. His eyes were compelling as the deep, cold blackness seemed to seek my attention. I sensed a venerable energy trying to control me. I backed off and stepped up onto the curb, and I uttered, No, no, I can't. I have friends waiting. I kept looking down. I didn't want to look into his black eyes, feeling like an insect in a spider's web. After a few seconds, he responded, Okay, never mind. Here come my friends. I looked up and passed him, and they were two young kids about a block away, and they were walking in our direction. Then I noticed that they weren't walking. Well, that their legs weren't moving. They hovered a few inches above the sidewalk and were floating towards us. I freaked out, quickly turned around to run, and as I did so... 
I heard a horrifying groan behind me. I ran faster than I ever thought was possible directly towards the hotel. I felt like they were right behind me. I had a painful sensation of something clawing at my back, a feeling I'll never forget. It was pure terror. When I reached the entrance to the hotel, I looked back and I found myself alone. I continued moving quickly, not stopping until I was back in my room. My girlfriend and the couple were startled to see me panting and bending over in pain, and they asked, what happened? Where's the wine? I collapsed onto the couch, and I didn't speak to them until I could catch my breath. I never told them what really occurred, only that some thugs tried to attack me. I no longer felt like playing host, and I told my guests that I wanted to call it a night. I didn't sleep a wink that night, fearing that these black-eyed kids would find me. Jason. Can you believe how creepy that is? You go down for a little... First of all, I'm sure you already got your buzz working. So that's going to be one thing somebody's going to say is, oh, the guy was drunk, right? The right. guy's had too much to drink. No, 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 no. I understand that, but I bet that'd knock you sober if you stumbled across some 16-year-old black-eyed kid. I do still love the fact that everybody talks about it being a negative, like... It's a very strange feeling, but how you feel drawn in. What about their feet not moving? Yeah, that's a little creepy, isn't it? You look down a block or two, and they're hovering towards you. Yeah. Nah, I'm out, man. Yeah, in Atlantic City, it's no less. So, I don't know. But look, let's okay, let's play devil's advocate. Is there children uh, running around there with, with contacts on, playing around, trying to scare people? It's not a good idea. Don't you think you, especially at two in the morning. I mean, look, it's one thing if you try to catch somebody off guard, but what if you caught the wrong dude off guard? Yeah. What if that guy was trying to break into that car and that kid was pretending to be a black eyed kid is messing with him and the dude turns around and just beats the tar out of him? Right. That's so it's one of those things that when you see that's what's so strange is it's one of those things we don't really know the real gist of it. We don't really know for a fact if the man that first came out with black eyed kids if it was a true story or not, if one time he says it's true, one time he says it's not true, you don't ever know now. It's gone too far. It's gone too deep. But it does seem like there's more and more people have these uh, these run-ins with them, and that's the strangest part. Right. Um, I was recently reading some articles online, and I saw this is pretty cool from the New York Times by Nicholas Fleur. It's about uh, between a T-Rex's powerful jaws, it mm. says bones of its prey actually exploded. Whoa, whoa, like from just the pressure alone. Exactly. Now, I know hyenas have super powerful jaws. I can't imagine a T-Rex. You'd be correct. Uh, also, crocodiles and things mm -hmm. like that. You know, sharks, of course, your favorite. It says recently a study published Wednesday suggests that a terrifying carnivore crushed its prey with a jaw-dropping 7,800 pounds of force. Yikes. More than double what any living species on Earth can currently deliver. Now, a guy named Gregory M. Erickson, a paleobiologist from Florida State University and co-author of the study that appeared in this Journal of Scientific Reports, stated that that's equivalent to putting three small cars on top of the jaws that's what's pushing down on you. He said, boom, it'll puncture through just about whatever is in there. Pressure pushing down right. on you. Even bone. It says the finding helps provide more evidence to the idea that the T-Rex shattered bones and then swallowed the fragments for sustenance. The behavior, known as extreme osteophagy, is seen today in carnivore mammals like gray wolves and spotted hyenas. But it's not seen in reptiles. Now, another guy named Paul M. Jignak, who's a paleobiologist at Oklahoma State University, and, no the folks. and the lead author of the paper said that if you could bite through bone, you can get to the nutrients from within the bone itself. And it turns out that this strategy of crushing and ingesting bones would have been particularly useful for the T-Rex. That said, it's according to these researchers, because the giant dinosaur was not only an efficient killing machine, but also was an opportunistic scavenger. If T-Rex came across the carcass, it could still enjoy an easy meal. Now, Dr. Erickson became curious with figuring out the bite force of the T-Rex as he was a graduate student in the mid-1990s when a colleague showed him a fossilized triceratops pelvis riddled with about 80 bite marks. His first question was whether the gashes were the work of some prehistoric giant crocodile or a tyrannosaur. In 1996, he and his colleagues reported that the puncture wounds had come from a T-Rex, and in subsequent research, Dr. Erickson and his colleagues also found that evidence of a digested bones in the fossilized excrement of a T-Rex, showing that the beast had consumed bones whole. How exactly the T-Rex could break bones was unclear, 
So the researchers calculated the prehistoric predator's bite force using a computer model they had created while studying the bite power of live crocodiles and alligators. To figure out the bite force of a long extinct T-Rex, the team created a digital T-Rex jaw based off muscle features found on close modern-day relatives to dinosaurs, like birds and several species of crocodilians. They also examined several T-Rex skulls to figure out how it had chewed. Using all that information, they came up with an idea of how a jaw muscles in a T-Rex would be arranged and then calculated the bite force. They found that an adult T-Rex could snap its mouth shut with a force of nearly 8,000 pounds. Today's champion chomper is the Australian saltwater crocodile, which can exert about 3,700 pounds of force. Human beings munch with a meager 200 pounds of force. So that's pretty cool. That's pretty cool. I know that the years, I say years, several years ago, I remember seeing something about this, that the T-Rex had the strongest bite of anything on land. Man, that isn't... Because what they said was the Megalodon actually has the strongest bite force. Really? Beca- yeah, because it's such bigger. It's such a bigger... Everything's bigger on it, basically. And I remember seeing something. It was like... a red- Like, you're talking like... This was something like three times stronger than a T-Rex, a Megalodon. But, I mean, Mother Nature, it makes sense. It if, does, If it's a large yeah. dinosaur is going to eat a Triceratops yeah. or another large dinosaur, you're t- you've seen the bones. If you're going to chomp through a bone that's one, one foot right? in diameter, you're going to have to have powerful jaws. And that's... You think of the nutrients that's in it. That's where it's... A lot of There's mar- nothing marrow, wasted. Yeah. Yes, nothing wasted. I still can't imagine what it would be like to see something like that. To see like a T Rex or just I mean something that enormous and that just terrifying. I just I can't wrap my just like I, I still you know the movie Jurassic Park. You, you see the the look on their face. I mean, it, could you imagine no. f- after studying it and maybe nobody told you and then it's like, look, I got a surprise for you, Kyle, well, and take you out and you get to see it. Well, luckily for you, I think in the next before you're dead, you'll probably get to see some extinct mammals like mastodons or something. Probably, yeah, you're probably. I don't know if you ever get to see a T Rex. Right. I hope not. I don't really want to see one. I'm good. I don't need to see one at all. Uh, you remember a few weeks ago we were talking about uh, the the orb that followed right over that lady's car. Yes, I remember right? that. And she yep. was like, look, it's right. I got something else here that comes from, from our buddy Roger over at OpenMinds.tv. This happened in Wisconsin. There was a report of orbs, multiples, hovering at a tree line. This is a, a Wisconsin witness at Sawyer County reported watching not one, not two folks, but three stacked orbs hovering at a nearby tree line for 45 minutes. Get out your pen and paper. It's case number 83015. The witness and his mother contacted Wisconsin field investigator Chad Labley, who completed this report, says that the witness was having a cigarette at 11.50 p.m. when he walked out onto his wraparound deck and came around the corner and immediately noticed a bright object out of his peripheral vision. Chad goes on to state in his report that it scared the heck out of him and that the witness immediately went and got his mother and she too noticed the object. Says that it was, as it was fairly cold, she only observed the phenomenon for about 10 minutes. He watched it steadily for 45 minutes straight. Went inside. That's impressive. Right? Went inside. Now get a load of this. Came out two hours later and it was gone. So for 45 minutes it was there. So we're kind of guessing i'm assuming maybe it wasn't stars it wasn't something that was stuck on that on the the horizon line there the object he observed quite well consisted of three orbs stacked on top of each other with an aura type force sparkling he says like a force field surrounding them said the orbs were 12 to 15 feet wide making the object about 36 to 45 feet tall it was observed hovering above a tree line that was approximately 1 football field away and two football fields high the orbs were solid not transparent the bottom was all white with a smear of pink the middle was aquamarine in color the top was whitish yellow to gold in color all three orbs were surrounded by an unbroken fuzzy force field outline existing about a foot away from the edges of these objects giving the objects the look of a full pea pod says the objects were described as brighter than any other observable star. The witness identified the North star as being to the East and not the object states that he did not think it could be a drone or Chinese lantern in any way. It made no noise. It did not move slowly as time went on. It hovered silently and stayed about 35 degrees above the horizon with several houses and a golf course beneath it 
It did not dim. It did not waver. The edges kind of sparkled like a sparkler. Hmm. So what it it sounds is look, it sounds almost like falling flares, but they were just frozen in space. Yeah, that's that's bizarre though. What freezes for forty five minutes sitting there? Now the aura I can understand because I've seen you know when it's cold or misty, you can kind of yeah. see and he's talking about already being cold. Right. You know, you can it makes it look like it's casting something from the water molecules in the air surrounding whatever's throwing the light. But it's strange how each one's a different light. They're perfectly stacked. What is stacked? vertically as such I couldn't that I, flies in the air i have no clue right what is that and it's hovering so we know it's not drones it's not making any noise and it didn't move i don't know of a drone that'll hover for 45 minutes i don't either so i look i get a kick out of these orb sightings especially though whenever they're running like this like stack like I'm, I'm thinking of like stoplights but these balls of different color are just stacked at each other 200 yards away or so man that is right i have crazy. no explanation another thing i had no explanation for is from time to time you see this poster where it's raining red uh blood in the streets yeah. or sometimes it's raining frogs in a country yeah you always wonder about how real that is well it turns out that it is real i saw this article over at the smithsonian.com by sarah Zelensky, and it's about and it's called strange rain why fish frogs and golf balls fall from the skies it says unusual precipitation doesn't just belong in myth and legend, and it's more common than you might think. It says earlier this year, a milky white rain coated cars, windows, and people in parts of Washington, Oregon, and Idaho. The precipitation wasn't dangerous, but it was a bit of a mystery. Rain is not pure water because precipitation can't form without some sort of particle to act as a nucleus, which gathers water molecules from the air until the drop gets heavy enough to fall. But sometimes rain is a lot dirtier than normal. Now, a guy named Brian Lamb, who's an air quality specialist at Washington State University, and his colleagues thought that the milky rain might be due to one of the wildlife burn scars that they were studying in the north, uh, the Pacific Northwest. But that was not the case. It turns out a dust storm had whipped up particles from a shallow lake bed in southern Oregon that had high amounts of saline, which caused the rain to be milky white. It says this unusual weather in the Pacific Northwest is just the latest in a long history of weird rains that may have scientific backing, according to a book called Rain, A Natural and Cultural History. It says frog and toad rains, fish rains, and colored rains, most often red, yellow, or black, are among the most common accounts of strange rain reported going all the way back to ancient times. Now, Heraclides Lembus, who was a Greek philosopher, who lived in the 2nd century B.C., writes that in Paeonia and Dardania, it has, they say, before now rained frogs. And so great has been the number of these frogs that the houses and roads have been full of them. The article goes on to claim that this phenomenon is not restricted to history. In fact, the village of Yoro in Honduras celebrates an annual festival to commemorate the rain of small silvery fish that allegedly happens at least once a year. And in 2005... Thousands of itty-bitty frogs reportedly rained down on a small town in northwestern Siberia. The frogs, different from those usually seen in the area, survived the fall and hopped around in search of water. Now, according to one news story, um, there's even more peculiar rains. Sometimes they're reported over history include hay, snakes, maggots, seeds, nuts, stones, and even shredded meat. Now, Barnett goes on to write that she even found one account of, a, of rain in golf balls in Florida, potentially linked to a water spout that crossed over a, a golf course. Now, John Knox, who is an atmospheric scientist at the University of Georgia, stated that whenever fish or frogs or golf balls or whatever it is are reported to have fallen with the rain, there has to be an event somewhere where there's the presence of a water spout or tornado. Something must have gone over a lake, he claims, sucked up a bunch of fish or other animal, and then dropped them somewhere else. That's how it's happening. Mm. Now, you may be asking yourself how far an object can travel, and he says it depends on the shape, the weight, and the wind. He stated that in his studies of tornado debris, he has actually documented printed photographs that traveled as far as 200 miles, and in one study, he found a metal sign that flew 50 miles away from where it was picked up. Whoa. He said that sign went up and did the magic carpet ride, so to speak. He also said that dust is the usual culprit behind these oddly colored rains. And he said that this kind of rain can travel a lot farther than you think. It says yellow dust that fell on western Washington in 1998 was actually gathered in the middle of the Gobi Desert. 
which is in China. Wow. And it says that the Sahara can spread its dust thousands of miles across the Atlantic. It says that the dust plume interacts with some precipitation. Then you've got the perfect ingredients for dust that and rain that'll fall in these different colors. They've had it happen from both the Sahara and the Gobi Desert. It'll, it won't rain till it gets over in America. That's awesome. Or somewhere else. So that's what it is. It's not folklore. It's not myth. This actually happens. Uh, sometimes you get this crazy colored rain, or sometimes you actually get fish or frogs or something. That's awesome. So how unusual is that? I love it. I love That's so crazy. Yeah, right. I, do, I think it's cool. It's strange, but, but pretty cool. Yeah. Okay, folks. Well, let's take a break. And when I get back from the break, I'm going to be bringing up one of the most famous cases of all time. We're going to be talking about the Rendlesham Forest incident. Stick with us, folks. You're listening to Expanded Perspectives. A couple of weeks ago, on Expanded Perspectives Elite, I reported on Russia's Roswell. That event happened on January 29th, around 8 p.m. in 1986, near the small town of Dalmogorsk in far eastern Russia. So that got me thinking. Are there any other countries that seem to have their very own Roswell-like crashes? And as it turns out, there are. So on today's show... I'm going to be talking about Britain's Roswell. That's right, folks. The Rendlesham Forest Incident. Now, in case you've been living under a rock, this is probably the second most famous UFO sighting of all time. The incident was named the Rendlesham Forest Incident due to a series of reported sightings of unexplained lights and the alleged landing of a craft or multiple craft of unknown origin in the Rendlesham Forest, which is located in Suffolk, England, in late December 1980, just outside RAF Woodbridge, used at the time by the United States Air Force. In this incredible event, dozens of United States Air Force personnel were eyewitnesses to various events over a two- or three-day period. The Ministry of Defense denied the event posed any threat to national security and stated that it was therefore never investigated as a security matter. Later, evidence indicated that there was a substantial Ministry of Defense file on the subject, which led to claims of a cover-up. Many interpreted this as part of a larger pattern of information suppression concerning the true nature of unidentified flying objects by both the United States and British governments. One person to take this view was eyewitness and deputy base commander Colonel Charles Holt. Another was former NATO head and United Kingdom Chief of Defense Staff Lord Peter Hill Norton, who stated that whatever happened at this United States Air Force base was certainly one of national security interests. However, when the file was released in 2001, it turned out to consist mostly of international correspondence and responses to inquiries from the public. Skeptics note that the lack of any in-depth investigation in the publicly released documents is consistent with the Ministry of Defense's earlier statement that they never took the case seriously. Included in the released files is an explanation given by Defense Minister Lord Trefgarn 
as to why the Ministry of Defense did not investigate further. The sightings have been explained as a misrepresentation of a series of nocturnal lights, a fireball, or the Orford Ness Lighthouse, and bright stars. Let's talk more about where this incident went down. And that's not just a clever play on words. Something did go down. Not a crash, but an intentional landing. But what was it? Rendlesham Forest is owned by the Forestry Commission and consists of about 5.8 square miles, or 15 square kilometers, of a deep coniferous forest interspread with broad-leaved belts, scrub brush or heathland, and wetland areas. It is located in the county of Suffolk, about 8 miles, or 13 kilometers, east of the town of Ipswich. The incident occurred in the vicinity of two former military bases, RAF Bentwaters, which is just to the north of the forest, and RAF Woodbridge, which extends into the forest from the west and is bound by the forest on its northern and eastern edges. At the time, both were being used by the United States Air Force and were under the command of Wing Commander Colonel Gordon E. Williams. The base commander was Colonel Ted Conrad, and his deputy was Lieutenant Colonel Charles Halt. Now, Halt's memo to the Ministry of Defense on the incident and his personal involvement in the second night of the sightings has given the case credibility. I've actually collected some audio of Halt on the night of the sightings. These recordings are of Halt as the event was unfolding. The main events of the incident, including the supposed landing or landings, took place in the forest, which starts at the east end of the base runway, or about 0.3 miles or 0.5 kilometers to the east of the east gate of RAF Woodbridge where guards first noticed mysterious lights appearing to descend in the middle of the forest. The forest extends about one mile, or 1.6 kilometers, beyond East Gate, ending at a farmer's field, where additional events allegedly took place. Orford Ness Lighthouse, which skeptics identify as the flashing light seen off to the coast by some of the airmen, is along the same line of sight, about five miles, or eight kilometers further east of the forest's edge. Around 3 a.m. on December 26, 1980, strange lights were reported by a security patrol near the east gate of RAF Woodbridge, apparently descending into nearby Rendlesham Forest. Hello, Tower. We got some strange activity going on out here at the east gate. Can you confirm? Are there any scheduled aircraft in the area? Negative, Katrina. Servicemen initially thought it was a downed aircraft, but upon entering the forest to investigate, they saw, according to Halt's memo, a strange glowing object, metallic in appearance, with colored lights. As they approached, it moved through the trees, and the animals on a nearby farm went into a frenzy. The craft left three impressions, or depressions, in the ground that were visible the next day. Shortly after 4 a.m., local police were called to the scene, but reported that the only lights they could see were those from the Orford Ness Lighthouse, some miles away on the coast. Say that again. About four feet off the ground, about 110 
10 degrees, getting a reading of about 4 clicks. Yes, sir. Yeah, but it... <laughs> Excuse me. Bounced out. Bounced out. I think it's something other than the ground. I think it's something that's... Something very it's large. tree right over. We have spoken the first night, but we've seen we're about 150 or 200 yards from the site. Everything else is just deathly calm. There is no doubt about it. There's some type of strange flashing red light ahead. There's yellow. I saw a yellow tinge in it, too. Weird. It, it, it appears to be maybe moving a little bit this way. It's, it's brighter than it has been. Yellow. It's coming this way. Also, it is definitely coming this way. Pieces of it are shooting off. There is no doubt about it. This is weird. After daybreak, on the morning of December 26th, servicemen returned to a small clearing near the eastern edge of the forest and found three small impressions in a triangular pattern, as well as burn marks and a few broken branches on some of the nearby trees. Plaster casts of the imprints were taken and have been shown in television documentaries. At 10.30 a.m., the local police were called out again, this time to see the impressions on the ground, which they thought could have been made by a small animal. Several servicemen in halt returned to the site again in the early hours of December 28, 1980, with radiation detectors, which detected radiation in the depressions and on the near side of a tree. Although the significance of the readings they obtained is disputed, they said they still got them. The deputy base commander, Lieutenant Colonel Charles Halt, investigated this sighting personally and recorded the events on a microcassette recorder. The site investigated by Halt was near the eastern edge of the forest. It was during this investigation that a flashing light was seen across the field to the east, almost in line with a farmhouse. The Orford Nest Lighthouse is visible further to the east in the same line of sight. Later, star-like lights were seen in the sky to the north and south, the brightest of which seemed to beam down a stream of light from time to time. There are claims that the incident was videoed by the United States Air Force, but if so, the resulting tape has not been made public. The first public report of the incident was published in the tabloid newspaper News of the World on October 2nd, 1983, beneath the sensational headline, UFO lands in Suffolk, and that's official. The story was based on an account by a former U.S. airman 
using the pseudonym Art Wallace, supposedly protect himself against retribution from the United States Air Force, although his real name was Larry Warren. The first piece of primary evidence to be made available to the public was a memorandum written by the deputy base commander, Lieutenant Colonel Charles Halt, to the Ministry of Defense. Known as the Halt Memo, this was made available publicly in the United States under the U.S. Freedom of Information Act in 1983. The memorandum was dated January 13, 1981, entitled Unexplained Lights. The two-week delay between the incident and the report might account for some errors in dates and times given. The memo was not classified in any way. Dr. David Clark has investigated the background of this memo and the reaction to it at the Ministry of Defense. His interviews with the personnel involved confirmed the cursory nature of the investigation made by the Ministry of Defense and failed to find any evidence for any other reports on the incident made by the United States Air Force or the United Kingdom apart from the HALT memo. Scottish researcher James Easton succeeded in obtaining the original witness statements made for Colonel HALT by several servicemen that saw the strange lights and possibly the craft that night, including Fred Buron, 81st Security Police Squadron, Airman First Class John Burroughs, 81st Airman, Edward Cabinsag, 81st Security Police Squadron, and Master Sergeant James Chandler, 81st Security Police Squadron, and Staff Sergeant Jim Penniston, 81st Security Police Squadron. These documents are now in the public domain, and scans of them are available on several websites. These documents describe the sighting of strange lights. Penniston, for instance, states that directly to the east of the East Gate, about one and a half miles or 2.4 kilometers, in a large wooded area, a large yellow glowing light was emitting above the trees. In the center of the lighted area, directly in the center ground level, there was a red light blinking on and off in five to ten second intervals, and a blue light that was being for the most part steady. Burroughs, Penniston, and Cabin Sag drove into the forest in search of the source of the lights. They heard strange noises. Burroughs reported a noise like a woman was screaming, and also that you could hear the farm animals making a lot of noises. Halt heard the same noises two nights later. In a CNN interview in January 2008, he said, The livestock around the barn seemed to be going crazy. Such a noise could also have been made by a muntjac deer in the forest which are known for their loud, shrill bark when alarmed. Cabin Sag said, We figured the lights were coming from past the forest, since nothing was visible when we passed through the wooded forest. We would see a glowing near the beacon light, but as we got closer, we found it to be a lit-up farmhouse. We got to a vantage point where we could determine that what we were chasing was only a beacon light off in the distance. Burroughs' statement also states that we could see a beacon going from around, so we went towards it. We followed it for about two miles before we could see it wasn't coming from a lighthouse. Penniston's statement is the only one that positively identifies a mechanical object as the source of the lights. He states that he was within 160 feet or 50 meters of the object, and it was definitely mechanical in nature. Penniston has subsequently claimed that, contrary to his statement at the time, he actually encountered a landed craft in the forest, which he circled, touched, and made notes of for 45 minutes. Although there is no corroborating evidence of this form other than witnesses, Penniston has shown on television a notebook in which he claims to have made real-time notes and sketches of the object. The notebook is headed with the date December 27th and the time 12.20 a.m., which does not accord with the date and time given by the other witnesses for the incident, although the date does accord with Halt's memo. Penniston claims that he saw the object at a different landing site from the one investigated by Halt, much closer to RAF Woodbridge. This is inconsistent with his initial assessment that the light lay a mile and a half from the east gate. This is an excerpt from one of many interviews with James Penniston. Here's, what, here's exactly what I was thinking. I'm going out there with my mindset was like this. I'm out, going to go out and set up an entry control point 
for a downed aircraft, a crashed, uh, we're going to go ahead and tag uh, classified material and body parts. That's what I'm thinking. And then we're going to set up the entry control points so we can get emergency response vehicles out there. When I got up to the area where I seen it wasn't an aircraft crash, and it was something that I couldn't identify, I was perplexed, uh, not understanding what I was seeing. I, I, I hadn't been trained for anything even close to that, you know. So here's my, the gear adjustments that were, were switching were just crazy. I went from uh, crash and recovery um, thoughts to, um, I don't know what I'm looking at. I don't know what is in front of me. It's, I'm confused. And uh, this is not, this is not a comfortable situation for a security supervisor. You're confused, you're not sure what you're doing, not sure what to do. And that's the feeling I was getting. Of course, I am talking back and forth with my, my teammates, and we're coming back with the same type of confusion. We're not sure what's going on in front of us. The craft was a triangular craft. It was uh, 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 black in color, very shiny. Uh, it was metal, but it was smooth as glass. Uh, uh, inside the fabric of this triangular craft, uh, there was a uh, light movement of red and blue running through the fabric of it. I had pasted it off and it measured nine feet by nine feet by nine feet. Uh, it was approximately, uh, based on my height, I'm six foot two, so I estimated it at uh, seven feet tall. Uh, it was uh, uh, very small for, uh, for aircraft. Um, it um, uh, had one of the things that I was looking at initially was, it was I was looking for um, uh, obvious things that aircraft have looking for landing gear looking for intake looking for exhaust looking for crew compartment looking for windows it was void of all those that's where the confusion comes in at I came back around to the right side of it. I saw, when I seen those glyphs, I seen that there's some writing up there. So I felt pretty comfortable at that moment because I said, okay, it's going to say United States Air Force prototype, something like that. Uh, it's going to say NASA on it. And then, of course, you know, I seen something that I hadn't seen before. The witnesses were unnerved by their experience and believed that they had witnessed something out of the realm of explanation. In June 2010, retired Colonel Charles Holt signed a notarized affidavit in which he again surmised what had happened. Then he stated he believed the event to be extraterrestrial and that it had been covered up by both the United Kingdom and the United States. He publicly stated, I believe the objects that I saw at close quarter were extraterrestrial in origin and that the security services of both the United Kingdom and the United States have attempted, both then and now, to subvert the significance of what occurred at Rendlesham Forest and RAF Bentwaters by the use of well-practiced methods of disinformation. Halt also dismissed claims that he and his men had confused a UFO with a lighthouse beam. While in Rendlesham Forest, our security team observed a light that looked like a large eye, red in color, moving through the trees. After a few minutes, this object began dripping something that looked like molten metal. A short while later, it broke into several smaller, white-colored objects, which flew away in all directions. Claims by skeptics that this was merely a sweeping beam from a distant lighthouse are unfounded. We could see the unknown light and the lighthouse simultaneously. The latter was 35 to 40 degrees off where all of this was happening. Contradictions between this affidavit and the facts as recorded at the time of Halt's memo and tape recording have been pointed out by others. In 2010, Base Commander Colonel Ted Conrad provided a statement about the incident to Dr. David Clark of Sheffield University. Conrad stated that, We saw nothing that resembled Lieutenant Colonel Halt's descriptions either in the sky or on the ground, and that we had people in position to validate Halt's narrative 
but none of them could. In a later interview, Conrad criticized Holt for the claims of this affidavit, saying, He should be ashamed and embarrassed by his allegation that his country and Britain both conspired to deceive their citizens over this issue. He knows better. Conrad also disputed the testimony of Sergeant Jim Penniston, who claims to have touched an alien spacecraft. He said that he interviewed Penniston at the time, and he had not mentioned any such occurrence. Conrad also suggested that the entire incident might have been a hoax. Hart's partial response to this was, Ted Conrad is either having memory problems, has his head in the sand, or is continuing the cover-up. Even his son has admitted to family talk sustaining to the incident. Through the years, Conrad has made conflicting statements about the events. First, he stated he never went out to look in the sky. Then he stated he never saw anything. Apparently, he doesn't remember talking to me on his radio about a UFO sending down light beams of light onto the base. Remind Conrad of his article in the Omni magazine dated March 1983. In the article, he describes the first incident in detail and concludes that those lads saw something, but I don't know what it was. Now he's smearing those involved. It's pretty clear there was a very intense confrontation with something in the forest. Does Conrad want to talk about how the airmen were then subjected to mind control efforts using drugs and hypnosis by the British and American authorities? Yes, Burroughs and Penniston have issues that relate to those events. So like me, you're probably wondering what did Conrad's statement actually say in the 1983 Omni article cited by Halt? Well, I located the article, and it is pretty interesting, and it's also contradictory to his latest claims. The article clearly states the following account attributed to Conrad. Colonel Ted Conrad, the base commander, recalls five Air Force policemen that spotted lights from what they thought was a small plane descending into the forest. Two of the men tracked the object on foot and came upon a large tripod-mounted craft. It had no windows, but was studded with brilliant red and blue lights. Each time the men came within 50 yards of the ship, Conrad relates, it levitated six feet in the air and backed away. They followed it for almost an hour through the woods and across a field until it took off at phenomenal speed. Acting on the reports made by his men, Colonel Conrad began a brief investigation of the incident in the morning. He went into the forest and located a triangular pattern abstainably made by the tripod legs. He did interview two of the eyewitnesses and concludes, those lads saw something, but I don't know what it was. Now, Suffolk Constabulary also have a record dated December 26, 1980, of a report from the law enforcement desk of RAF Woodbridge stating that we have a sighting of some unusual lights in the sky. We have sent some unarmed troops to investigate. We are terming it a UFO at present. The police investigated this report, and the result is recorded as follows. Air traffic control West Drayton checked. No knowledge of any aircraft. Reports received of aerial phenomena over southern England during the night. Only lights visible in this area was from the Orford Lighthouse. Search made of area, negative. Now, skeptic Ian Ridpith has speculated the report, Aerial Phenomena, refers to the re-entry of the Soviet Cosmos 749 satellite's final stage rocket, which was widely seen over southern England shortly after 9 p.m. on the evening of December 25th. A letter in the police file notes that one of the PCs returned to the site in daylight in case he had missed something. There was nothing to be seen, and he remains unconvinced that the occurrence was genuine. He stated, The immediate area was swept by a powerful light and beams from a landing beacon at RAF Bentwaters and the Orfordness Lighthouse. I know from personal experience that at night, in certain weather and cloud conditions, these beams were very pronounced and certainly caused strange visual effects. Some researchers have claimed that personnel from Porton Down visited Rendlesham in 1980 after the Rendlesham Forest incident. No evidence has been presented, and there seems to be confusion with other alleged UFO incidents. Admiral Lord Hill Norton, the former Chief of the United Kingdom's Defense Staff, 
argued that an incident like this at a nuclear weapons base was of high national security interests. As a member of the House of Lords, Lord Hill Norton asked Her Majesty's government whether they are aware of any involvement by Special Branch in the investigation of the 1980 Rendlesham Forest incident. Baroness Simmons of Vernham Dean gave the reply that Special Branch officers may have been aware of an incident but would not have shown any interest unless there was evidence of a potential threat to national security. No such interest appears to have been shown. Hill Norton commented, Either large numbers of people were hallucinating, and for an American Air Force nuclear base, this is extremely dangerous, or what they say happened did happen. And in either of those circumstances, there can only be one answer, and that is, it was of extreme defense interests. In 2001, the British government released its file on the incident to researchers following a request from Dr. David Clark under the Code of Practice for Access to Government Documents, a precursor to the Freedom of Information Act. The Ministry of Defense has since made these documents available online. The United States continues to remain silent. Over the years, there have been many theories as to what the men saw that night from light beams refracted from the lighthouse to a meteorite re-entering the Earth's atmosphere to the Russian satellite breaking up over the North Sea or to be an all-out hoax. But one of the most prominent believers in the extraterrestrial origin of the Rendlesham UFOs is a guy I have been lucky enough to personally meet myself, Nick Pope, who worked for the MOD researching and investigating UFO phenomenon between 1991 and 1994. He discussed the Rendlesham Forest incident in his various books and in several articles like Rendlesham, The Unresolved Mystery, and The Rendlesham Files Reviewed. He has gone on record and told me that the Rendlesham Forest incident is bigger than Roswell, and if true, I may have to agree. I think I saw something under intelligent control. Now, I never saw personally a mechanical ship or some clearly defined shape. What I saw were lights. I saw three different things. I saw a glowing red eye-like ball that was dripping like molten metal that came toward us, that moved, it came into the forest, moved through the trees, missing the trees, obviously under control. The item moved back into the field and exploded and was gone. There were all three objects to the north in the sky that were, had multicolored lights that moved in synchronization as though they were doing a grid search. We watched them for quite a while and we saw two objects to the south. They were white, bright lights. We couldn't discern a shape. There was a shape, but I couldn't tell what it was. One came overhead at high speed, very high speed, two or three thousand feet up, and sent down a laser-like beam at our feet. Just click was on. I stood there in awe, very concerned. Is it a weapon? Is it a warning? Is it a communication? And as suddenly as it appeared, it disappeared. The object then moved back to the south. The sister object to the south came over Bentwater's base and sent down similar beams in or near the weapon storage area. I can't say they went in. A lot of people didn't say much and kept their mouth shut for years till they retired. I've had a lot of statements now. I have confirmation from the air traffic control people. They saw the object go across their scope, 60 mile scope in two or three seconds, thousands of miles an hour. It came back across their scope again, stopped near the water tower, which wasn't far from them. They observed it. They watched it go over and go into the forest where we were. Watersham radar, radar, eastern radar we called it, <clears throat> definitely picked something up and it was, how should I say, uh, it disappeared, so to speak, the recording and all. But one of the operators has confirmed that they did pick up a bogey, they called it, and it went into the forest, or they lost it near Rendlesham Forest. Our controller in the weapon storage area, we have a big tire there, saw the object, and so did a call man that was working there. Three or four of the people on the ground in the weapon storage area went up and got a 12 power binoculars and the objects in the sky, they say, were triangular. I could not see the shape because of the, they were bright. They were just too bright to, to pick out a shape. Whatever was there was obviously under intelligent control. My personal feeling is there was some type of a mothership or bigger entity or something that was controlling what was on the ground and perhaps some of what we saw in the sky. I don't know. One of the people in the weapon storage area say he saw a much larger craft. None of them told me this at the time. I didn't find this out until years later, when they all retired. The air traffic controllers were asked, well, why didn't you confirm? Because I was kept calling the command post asking, you know, look here, what do you see? And they kept saying they see nothing. And the air traffic controllers told me, 
that they knew any time an air traffic controller reported a UFO, they got decertified. They became a cook or a baker or a copper or some other such thing. So they said, hey, zip, we don't talk about it. I have signed sworn statements from them that, that they did what they saw. Colonel Charles Halt believes he and some of his men witnessed something otherworldly and still believes that it's being covered up. He has gone on to speak about this. I've never met Colonel Halt, but I have spoken with a man that was there that night. Last year, at the Ozark Mountain UFO Conference, I met and spoke with, at the time of the incident, Airman First Class John Burroughs. He told me what he saw that night. He was with Sergeant James Penniston, and he backs up his claims. Over the years, I've had hundreds of people tell me about their experiences or sightings, and you kind of get a feel for people who are lying. John is not one of those guys. He's a large guy, someone you wouldn't want to tangle with in a fight. He's also very knowledgeable and very straightforward, a no-nonsense kind of guy. You kind of have to be to be in his profession. I mean, guarding an American Air Force nuclear base is not a place for pranksters. And that's one of the reasons I find this sighting so compelling. Do you honestly expect me to believe that several military guards, as well as a lieutenant colonel of the base, all got together over a couple of nights to make up a good story? That's ridiculous. I think something otherworldly did happen that night, or a series of nights over the Reynoldsham Forest, and I think the two governments know about it and hope that it would never come to the light of day. But now that it's out, they just ignore the whole event. In the end, it's for you to decide. For more information about the event, as well as the full interview of James Penniston, see the show notes. You're listening to Expanded Perspectives. Not all ingredients are created equal. Fresh, high-quality ingredients can really make the difference, Cam, so it's important to know where your food comes from. Blue Apron shows up at your door with all the ingredients individually packaged and ready to go, along with clear and easy-to-follow instructions on how to prepare everything. Blue Apron has established partnerships with over 150 local farms, fisheries, and ranches across the United States, and as a result, Seafood is sourced sustainably under standards developed in partnership with the Monterey Bay Aquarium Seafood Watch. Beef is raised humanely, and chickens are free-range, and pork is raised naturally. When me and my wife go out for dinner, it's at least $30 or $40 every time. That's not including the kids. But for less than $10 per meal, Blue Apron delivers seasonal recipes along with pre-portioned ingredients to make delicious home-cooked meals, and pre-portioned means no food waste. Each meal is prepared in under 40 minutes, and you can save the recipe cards for future use if you decide to choose to. Uh, some of the meals available in May include... I'm going to read these off to y'all. Look, these are going to be great, folks. Beef teriyaki stir-fry with sugar snap peas and lime rice. Baked spinach and egg flatbread with sautéed asparagus and lemon aioli. Three cheese, not one, not two, folks. Three cheese and baby broccoli stromboli with tomato and oregano dipping sauce and crispy salmon and roasted potato salad with pickled mustard seeds and creme fraiche sauce. Check out this week's menu and get your first three meals free with free shipping by going to blueapron.com forward slash expanded. You will love how it feels and tastes to create incredible home-cooked meals with Blue Apron. So don't wait. 
That's blueapron.com forward slash expanded. Blue Apron, a better way to cook. And we're back with Expanded Perspectives. I love the story of the Rendlesham Forest. It's another one of these mass sightings by credible people, mm-hmm. credible witnesses. And me and you are lucky enough to actually speak with one of the person, one of the people that actually saw it, actually saw you know some of this strange stuff flying around the sky. I'm talking about John Burroughs. Mm-hmm. We met John Burroughs last year in the Ozark Mountain UFO Conference. And I'll tell you the story. Um, me and Cam and, and Micah Hanks, we left here in Texas and we drove up to Arkansas. And the first night we were there, we got there after dark. And um, we checked into our hotel, and about that time, Habo called our room and was like, hey, man, what are you guys doing? We're like, nothing. He's like, well, why don't you come over to my room, and we're kind of hanging out. Mm-hmm. So we went and stopped at the beer store and got some treats and, and a couple of uh, six-packs of beer, and we headed on over to Habo's place, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I remember walking in. It was a really weird feeling. You walk in, and there on the balcony is Race Hobbs, his wife, Robin, uh, John Burroughs, and Richard Dolan. And the D-Man. That's the D-Man right. himself. And and me and Micah and Cam proceeded to sit on that balcony and uh, drink beer and smoke cigars with John Burroughs, Richard Dolan, and Hobbo. Yeah. And it was quite, a, it was a very interesting night, a neat experience, you know, and I kind of asked John, you know, about his experience and stuff. And we didn't get into a lot of detail, but man, I don't know, he told me some very strange things. It's pretty cool. And, you know, now I think he's actually having uh, several medical problems. Yeah. And he's, you know, trying to get the military to cover some of those expenses because, yeah. you know, he's wondering if... Some of the things he saw might be having some kind of effect on him now with his health. And and there's a good chance. There's a really good chance that there's something like that went on. You know, and I think that um, the Ministry of Defense, it seems just like in our country, seems to be, they know a lot more than what they're saying and they're mm-hmm. trying to cover that up. You know, there's all these crazy things like, oh, they were seeing light refracted from a lighthouse. And it, it, like, dude, <laughs> not even not close, what we saw. Man. Not even yeah. Yeah, close. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> and it's one of the very few times, unlike the Roswell crash, you know, where there's actual audio tape yes. of the events. So yeah. one of my favorite stories of all time, probably the second biggest UFO sighting uh, of all time. Very yeah. cool. Very cool. Uh, let's talk about our sponsors real quick. Gaia.com. Gaia is a video streaming service, much like Hulu or Netflix. And over there, they got 7,000 titles to check out. All kinds of cool stuff. We talk about it all the time. But they got a new thing going over there in the secrets um, uh, category of documentaries. It's about exposing big agriculture. And it's about from unsustainable practices to chemical additives. The food that is meant to nourish our bodies has left many of us in disease. Now, this devastating truth behind modern agriculture paints a picture of impoverished laborers alongside thriving, wasteful industrial giants. When profit is valued over human health and well-being... Is there anything that can uproot this system? Let's take a listen. The problem is that we are not eating food anymore. We are eating food like products. And they are adorned. They are made to look better and smell better so that people are attracted to them. It's not your fault. You're programmed to put on fat whenever there is food available. But now there's a lot of food available, but it's the wrong kind. Sugar is in everything. In America, we're eating about 22 teaspoons of sugar a day. Even the milk hasn't escaped. So, let me just show you. One kid, just for five years of elementary school, sugar, just from milk. You might as well be rolling up the kid's sleeves and putting in heroin, because it's the same. The marketing essentially lies to you. Because it presents you with the promise you're going to be sexy and popular and cool. But in reality, you're going to be obese and miserable and sick. Nothing else does it in your brain quite like a diet cola. And that's because there's a deadly combination there of aspartame and caffeine. I think most people believe the FDA actually has their own scientists that do this analysis. But nothing could be further from the truth. If I was in the food industry, what am I looking to do? I want to sell you more food. They're into just selling a mind. 
you can lose weight on a diet, but it's a little bit like borrowing from Peter to pay Paul. I mean, you can get 10 pounds off your body through sheer force, but you're going to have to pay back with interest. People know this, so why are highly intelligent people not stopping? Because they don't know the nature of the trap. Well, there you go. And that's just one of the very, that's one of the many cool documentaries and films that are over there only on Gaia that's G-A-I-A dot com forward slash expanded perspectives if you want to check this out plus much much more and you want to support this show then you need to sign up by going to Gaia dot com forward slash expanded perspectives there's three plans to choose from and if you go sign up now your first month is only 99 cents also let's not forget about Blue Apron check out this week's menu and you'll get your first three meals free with free shipping by going to blueapron.com forward slash expanded. Remember, by supporting our sponsors, you're supporting this show. Now, over the last couple of weeks, we've mentioned this Q&A with Cam and Kyle. So, Cam, you ready to get into three more of these? We're you gonna bet. We're going to reach down into the grab bag and pull out three lucky listeners' email, and uh, we're going to get into this. Okay, so here we go. The first one is from Amanda Long, and it says, Have either of you had any paranormal experiences? If so, what were they? What paranormal experience do you want to have? Which ones do you not want to have? I love your podcast. It opened up a whole new world for me. Listen to several paranormal podcasts now, but you guys were my first and are still my favorite. You guys are so fun. I really appreciate you guys taking the time out of your busy lives to entertain us and explore life's mysterious side. Take care, Mandy. P.S. Do more song covers. (laughs) <laughs> and do you know if the 411 documentary has been released yet? Now, I will start off, Mandy, by saying thank you. We do need to do some more song covers. Do we? <laughs> do we really? <laughs> yeah, we do. Uh, as far as the 411 documentary, if it's been released yet, you are very, you're, you're perfect, perfect timing on this email. Actually, I think it has been released only on DVD and Blu-ray. I need to talk to David. I spoke, I spoke to him just a couple weeks ago, actually, seeing if he wanted to come on and promote it. And uh, he said he was too busy. But he needs to get with the times, man. It doesn't appear that they have any live streaming right now. So you can buy a DVD or Blu-ray if you go to Can Am, uh, whatever the name of his website is, Can Am Project or something yeah. like that. You can search it up. Uh, but that's the only way I know of right now. But let's get to the question at hand. Cam, have you had any paranormal experiences? And if so, what was it? No. I don't think I've ever had one. Now, I did tell a story a while back, like whenever I was on Jim Harold's podcast about my grandfather, and then me thinking that I saw my grandmother, you know, in the mirror and all yeah. that stuff, but I still don't know. I don't know if that's really, is that paranormal? I no. don't know, because I don't, I, I've, since that point, I've really done a lot of thinking, and, and I don't know if that was what it was, or if it was just me wanting, you know, I don't know, it's hazy. Right. Over the last few years, it's a hazy memory of me thinking, is that really, I, I don't know, but so I would have to say, no, I've never had a paranormal experience well, whatsoever. Mine would, be, mine would be very similar to answer to yours. I did see something I've mentioned it many times when I was younger and deer hunting on the top of this plateau. Mm-hmm. And the wind was blowing. It was an early morning hunt and it was dark. And uh, I saw something about the size of a basketball. It looked green in nature, moving against the wind. Mm-hmm. I'm not sure what that was. Yeah, it, It's almost one of those things where it's kind of hazy in your memory but i remember not being the only fellow that saw it so i guess that's paranormal yeah but that's about it but you don't have anything other than it so you won't really label it yeah i don't know what that is yeah um is there any paranormal experience that you want to have bigfoot i still would love to see bigfoot personally i would love to be somewhere either kayak and just somewhere out in the woods and actually see or let me rephrase that the little people that's mine the mine's a, like a duende or yeah. a fey folk yeah, that's what fae. i would like to see a little gnome with a beard yep, and a pipe that's, that's me that's what i would like to witness is there any that you do not want to have all of them but the fey and the <laughs> if it's not bigfoot or if it's not uh, the little people of the woods i don't want to see any of it i would say i'm down i'm out i would have to say for me it would be Aliens, like extraterrestrials. Like I said many times, uh, dog man is scary, Bigfoot is scary, but if you don't go in the woods, it's easy to avoid. What about black-eyed it, kids? Yeah, that, yeah, I don't know. They don't seem What about waking me. up and there'd be like the, the, the grinning man or the slender man or the hat man? Or See, I don't want to see any of that's, them. That's true. None. I don't want any of it. I don't want to wake up with anything looking at me. No, really. <laughs> I don't want it to be within arm's reach. It's in my hula hoop space, man, and I'll panic. Well, hopefully that answers your question, Amanda. Thank you so much for the kind words. Let's move on to the next one. This next one is from a man named Matt Reynolds from Tulsa, Oklahoma. He said, hi, my name is Matt Reynolds, and I'm from Tulsa. What was your first car and the best memory you had with it? 
Also, whatever happened to that car? Thanks, you guys rock. Matt. Uh, Cam, do you remember what your first car was? An 86 single cab Chevrolet pickup. One of the two-tone, the brown and cream. I remember that. You remember that one? That was the, the very first vehicle I ever owned. Uh, what did we do with it? What was your thing? best memory you had with it? Oh, there was a lot of memories <laughs> that you and I had in that truck. Uh, man, you know what? Probably leaving that party uh, when you and I had to flee the scene and we were uh, through clothes in the back. We're racing around in our underwear trying to get home. Yeah, I remember That's that. probably one of those. It was probably one of those memories. It was That was a good time. Yeah. I, it ended up having some mechanical issues and we ended up selling that truck. My father and I sold that I truck you. off. I wished I would have never gotten rid of that pickup. I still, one of the old square bodies. Yeah. I wish I still had that truck somewhere. Like For me, that. my first car was, uh, I actually started building it a year before I could even drive it. It was a 73 Comet GT. Well, first of all, let's rephrase this. You got it when you were 14. Yes, that's correct. And and you, my we, grandfather was... We used he, to hot rod it in the fields. <laughs> first of all, I got it from my grandfather, but he wouldn't give me anything. He made me purchase it from him. But, yes. I mean, he made me purchase it for like a, a minimal fee, like $6, something ridiculous. <laughs> yeah. He's like, no, you're going to have to give me $6 before I sign the title. Yeah. yeah. So he did. And you're right. Uh, we, we jumped it and stuff. We drove it around on the ranch for a while because <laughs> yeah. I had plans of redoing it. So when that engine crapped out... I never drove it on the road. Of course, I was too young to drive. Yeah. But my dad was a kind of guy that liked to build hot rods. So we totally rebuilt the entire thing. Everything. Everything you could think of was totally restored. And then we put a, I think it was a 351 Cleveland in it. Mm-hmm. Big four, uh, big uh, V8 engine in it. And uh, we would just drive around all over the place. I remember when I could drive, my fondest memory mm-hmm. is uh, uh, one time I was getting out early for like a dentist appointment or something. And there was a police officer in our town. And of course, back then, there's people that I... They're going to label this because they like to pick on us from being t- from Texas. But funny enough, at that time, they used to patrol some parts of the city on horseback. And yes. I remember that the guy was on horseback. I know exactly which officer you're speaking of. And he <laughs> apparently had witnessed me days earlier peeling out stuff like that in the car. So he was trying to get me to pull over. And, of course, I knew kind of what he wanted, but I wasn't going to stop. So then I just <laughs> continued to lay a patch of rubber. <laughs> About 150 feet long. <laughs> yeah, I remember White smoking the tires on that car so many times. Yeah, and of course I got in trouble weeks later for it. Uh, you got to remember this was a small town. Go ahead so and tell them what happened us. to it. And uh, <laughs> so that was my best memory with it. Whatever happened to that car? A uh, couple months later, I don't think I even owned the car more than like 18 months. I uh, had too much to drink, leaving a party. I uh, was reaching over, changing a Stevie Ray Vaughan CD out of the thing, and I uh, hit a ditch and rolled it. I was completely unharmed. I just remember uh, being upside down. I was pissed. I got out on feet, and I ran all the way to my grandfather's house, which was about 12 <laughs> miles away, in the middle of the night. Yeah. Knocked on his door. He's like, what the heck are you doing? I told him the whole thing. He sit down. A few minutes later, I guess the DPS found my car, tracked it down to me, and uh, they pretty much yelled at me, but they couldn't do anything. So they were like, you know, you never leave, leave the scene of an accident. Yeah. Stuff, but I'm like, I'm no dummy. If they show up, yeah. I'm going to jail. It took them several hours to find you. But so by then, the time, yeah. uh, of course, this was a long time ago. So this was like 1993 or four. If it happened today, they probably would have been on me faster. Yeah. But back then, they finally, they talked to me the next morning. Yeah, I want to say. And by was, that time, I was sober. Was it 94? So we'd, we'd already graduated. It was right after graduation, yeah. wasn't mm-hmm. it? Yeah. So, yeah. you know, as I'm saying, they did talk to me the next morning. But yeah. by that time, I was sober. And I think they knew what happened. Oh, They're yeah. Like, Don't they ever knew. leave the scene of an accident. I'm like, <laughs> look, I understand if I hit somebody, that would be one thing. But I didn't wreck anything but my own car. I ain't hanging around. <laughs> right? So yeah. I was out. Say I'm out. Say Deuces. <laughs> Okay, yeah. let's move on to the next one. Number three comes from a woman named Olivia Evans from Watford, England. And she writes in and says, Hello, guys. You are by far and away my favorite podcast. Thank you for putting in all the hard work week after week and never taking off. For God's sakes, take a break. Anyway, my question is, what are your top three movies of all time from any genre and why? Please do not use Predator or The Terminator. <laughs> Your friend from across the pond, Olivia. <laughs> Thanks, Olivia, Thanks, for the Olivia. kind words, and you're correct. We cannot say those two. So, Cam, from any genre, what are your top three movies of all time, excluding The Predator and Terminator, starting with number three and moving your way up to number one? 
You go first. I'll you give your number three first, then I'll give my number three, and so forth. My what? number three uh-huh. would be Blade Runner, the original Blade Runner. Oh, good choice. Yeah, that's one of my one of my top. It's hard to pick. A if thing, I was going to say, in reality, it would take know, hours for me hours to for me to think. Of, and I don't even know if I could ever. They would change due to like my uh, my my moods, Emotion. my emotions. You're right. Exactly. I love. Ridley Scott films. He does. I think he does a great job, okay, well, especially well, his well, earlier work. I think he does a great job. I love you know the writing of Philip K. Dick and all mm-hmm. that. So that's what. And David Peoples is another one of the men that wrote that that movie itself. And so yeah, but I'm a big fan of Blade Runner. My number three would be, or what I've written down here is the original Jaws. Oh, oh I that's love another that movie. one. Yeah, I mean, it's like a classic horror movie to me. Yeah, it's still terrifying. And I guess what makes it most terrifying is they're, they're real. I should have said that because, <laughs> yeah. but because I, I watch it all the time. I do too. But it's almost like it's one of those that Oopa. I don't really. I mean, it's yeah. So, I don't really consider it like a fave. It's almost part of the family type movie. But it is, and it's, yeah. like I said, what's most terrifying yeah. is that it's real. Yeah. What's your number two? My number two, of course, it's <laughs> like I said, it comes from David Peoples. He wrote this movie, and it was directed by Clint Eastwood. And it's you talk about any genre. I'm a huge fan of his movie the unforgiven or just unforgiven uh-huh. the old western because i was like i told william people, money is that his yes william name? money exactly that's clean sweat i was raised on a ranch i was raised in the country i was raised with horses and cattle and team roping and bull riding and i was raised in the this whole thing so i didn't know what anything outside of watching westerns and louis lamore books and country music i had no idea any of that was even part of of society or the world until i was about 15 years old and i didn't know that part of the world because my whole family's from new jersey yeah so i was a transplant so i was born here but i mean you know what i mean i was raised by exactly Yankees, so i learned that world from hanging out with you exactly <laughs> so yeah it was weird the whole cross yeah me and kyle exactly i didn't know anything about the rolling stones or Jimi hendrix or any of that until led zeppelin until i met kyle and then he brought me into that world so but this is one of those movies i have a special spot for westerns because it always reminds me of my childhood uh-huh. of being a kid and this is one of those ones i just love this film well I it's just, funny enough I'm that great you, with it it's funny enough that you say that is because the all three of the top three of my movies are all movies from when i was a kid yeah it's like that time solidified it means more to me than now i agree yeah. uh my number two is star wars return of the jedi yep there you go well, I don't. I like. I like all of them. Yes. But when I was a kid, in the original three, that was my favorite one. Yeah. I guess because they were on Endor, and you got to see the speeder bikes, and you got to see more of the They're lightsaber the fighting and stuff. Yeah. I like that one. What's your number one? My number one, man. This is going to be a tough one, and and I feel bad about this one because it's more. It was a television miniseries. Oh, is okay. what it actually was. I, got, was. I know. I bet you I know what it is. You know exactly which one it is. It was written by a fellow from Archer City, Texas, named Larry McMurtry. Is the fellow that wrote it. And folks, that's up near uh, Wichita Falls, actually, is where that's at. Uh, it's the movie Lonesome Dove, the television miniseries called Lonesome Dove is what it is. And it was one of my all-time favorite and still is one of those things that I can put it on at any time and watch it. And you want to talk about the people that are in it. You can just, if you haven't seen it, check it out because it's, I mean, it's got everybody. I remember, all being, the actors um, in it. I remember seeing it as a kid and being very sad that they were killing their buddy Jake. Uh, yeah, well, yeah, it's well, don't give away the whole thing. People need to see it. <laughs> it's Let been, us know I look, what you spoiler think. alert, it's been out for 30 years. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, exactly. Well, another thing that makes it really interesting is because a lot of that took place with Bo's Acker from around here in Weatherford. That's another one of those things, too, is it has ties to this town and the, and the whole the cattle drive and all that stuff that takes place from around here. So it really was. I mean, you're, you're talking about some of the best actors around that are in that movie. Okay, folks, my number one. If I have to choose one, I got so many, but if I had to pick one, I would have to say Raiders of the Lost Ark. That's probably my favorite movie. That is time. a great flick, yeah. I love all the Indiana Jones, of course, but I still remember that very first one. That actually, that's probably what sparked my interest in archaeology, to be probably honest. Probably still, my, it is, out of all of them, I think it's still my absolute favorite, Indiana Jones. I think it's even all my, you know what, I'll say this, as crazy as it sounds. If you gave me Star Wars or Indiana Jones, I would still take Raiders of the Lost Ark over any of those. I would too, because it's real. Yeah, it and, just and it's a classic something. case of you know, mystery uh, with ancient cultures. you got the classic enemy with the Nazis. Yeah. It's just, I don't know, I really... How scared were you it. when those things started flying around, coming out of the Ark like that? Because I remember being a kid like, oh, yeah. what in the hell is this? She's beautiful. Yeah, I and remember melts, freaking yeah. out. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, man, that's about it. Cam, I hope that you are having a good time in Las Vegas right now. I uh, hope you don't blow all the money. Please, I, I had to take away the show's uh, credit cards and things. So that's right. In there, wipe us out. 
And this will be the last episode. I had to sign a bunch of paperwork, <laughs> so if I get killed, it all goes to Kyle. Please. Everything, everything you get. So, yeah, so mm-hmm. got to make sure Kyle doesn't shoot me down or anything like that. All right. Well, everybody out there, please have a good week. Remember, if you have a story of your own you would like to share with the show, you can email us always at expandedperspectives at yahoo.com. You can call the show 817-945-3828. You can follow us on all forms of social media. And if you'd like to help out the show, write us a review on iTunes. It really helps. I hope everybody out there has a great week. Stay out of trouble, folks. And we'll be speaking to you again next Friday. I'm Kyle Filson. He's Cam Hale. Peace, y'all.